Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our Zoom webinar, The Basics with Dr. Bori. We are excited to be able to offer education during this time of physical distancing. This webinar is being recorded and will be archi archived for future viewing. Since everyone's situation is unique, the information being provided in this presentation is for educational purposes and not specific advice for your situation. Should you have specific questions about your situation, please contact your support worker for further discussion. At the end of the presentation, we will have a Q&A session and we will do our best to answer as many questions as we can. During the presentation, please feel free to add your questions in the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. You may need to move your mouse around to find the Zoom controls and click on the Q&A icon for it to appear. Should you have any comments or concerns during the presentation, please type them in the chat box. Again, you will find this icon at the bottom of your screen. Today, we have the pleasure of having a guest speaker with us, Dr. Michael Borey, who will be presenting on Dementia, the Basics. Dr. Borey is a geriatrician at Parkwood Institute, St. Joseph's Healthcare, London. He is the medical director of the Aging Brain and Memory Clinic and researcher with the Cognitive Clinical Research Group. I will now turn it over to our presenter. Dr. Bore, please begin when you are ready. Thank you, good evening. I need to um, uh, I need just first of all to disclose any conflicts of interest. We have research funding for our group through. Uh, public agencies, the CIHR, the National Institutes of Health, the Alzheimer's Society Canada, and also uh, I've been involved with creating and delivering continuing medical education programs for family physicians, as well as clinical funding from the companies listed there on the left. And over the last 28 years, we've been involved with clinical trials with funding from the companies listed on the right. One of the things we want to uh, cover is look at the spectrum of cognitive decline and the common underlying diseases that contribute to this, Alzheimer's disease, strokes, and Lewy body, and you may be familiar with some of these terms. We want to talk about when a visit to a family doctor might be warranted and what to expect. Uh, learn about risk factors for dementia and how each of us can lower our risk to keep our brains healthy. We'll do an update on the research particularly research that's available here at Parkwood Institute and learn about the opportunities to actually participate in research. So Alzheimer described this uh, person over 100 years ago. She was 52 years old at the time when she developed symptoms. The disease progressed rapidly, beginning with memory impairment. She had paranoia, became immobile, and after four years had died. And he did autopsy examination of the brain and found that there were these things called plaques and tangles. And I'll elaborate on what these were later, but he didn't know what they were. It became called Alzheimer's disease. And it was recognized that this um, or was thought to be different uh, from senility, which developed in people in their late uh, 70s and 80s. And later on in the 60s, they realized that the pathology in the brain was exactly the same. So they realized that senile dementia and Alzheimer's disease were the same things. And so the term evolved to become senile dementia, Alzheimer's type, and more recently, dementia probable Alzheimer's disease. All of these terms are synonymous, meaning the same thing. Now, it's important because there are, in the next 18 years, there will be over a million people in Canada with this disease. And there will be um, over 50% of these will still live in the community. It is a disease more common with old age, but it's not caused by old age. And it does have a cost, and this has been estimated from the rising tide uh, uh, document produced by Alzheimer's Society Canada uh, with estimates of the costs in 2038, uh, both the direct costs, the lost opportunity costs for informal caregivers and also the direct cost uh, 
that they may be paying uh, in providing that caregiving. I spend a little bit of time on this, uh, what we call the spectrum of cognitive decline. So if any of you have been involved with the Aging Brain and Memory Clinic, I apologize for you having seen this before. On the left, people who are regarded as super normal over the age of 80, who score the same as 20 year olds on memory tests. People uh, who are considered as normal with age consistent loss, because there is loss over, over time. These people are not concerned about uh, memory loss and they score normally on memory tests. People, however, may start to observe themselves subjective changes in their memory and it may not be apparent to anyone else and they may be concerned about this and then they'll go to a family doctor and have a memory test and they'll score in the normal range 26 or more on the mocha and I'll explain what we mean by the mocha in a subsequent slide. Mild cognitive impairment is a further state where there is definite decline so they're scoring less than 26 out of 30 on the mocha but what we call the instrumental activities of daily living. So those are the tasks we do during the day, banking, grocery shopping, housework, yard work, cooking, to the extent that any of us did those things, that those things are largely intact. They may be a bit slower in completing those tasks. They may have make some minor errors, but otherwise they can continue the tasks. And then dementia, is where the instrumental activities of daily living are becoming impaired and sometimes even some of the self-care activities later on will be impaired so dressing grooming toileting you can see uh, that at 65 and over in canada today eight percent have dementia 17 percent mild compayment for a combined total of 25 percent and 75 percent pretty normal but by the age of 85 one third dementia one third with mild compound, one third in the normal range. So this is a disease occurring in older age. And then it can progress, prodromal dementia is that interval between mild cognitive impairment and dementia where we may not be entirely sure whether or not a person's instrumental activities of daily living are impaired. We're, we're getting an idea they are, but it's not clear cut and then progressing through the different stages of dementia. And we use the mini mental state scores, which is another way of scoring a person's impairment. It's the so-called American tests also scored out of 30. And so mild dementia is 20 to 26, uh, moderate dementia 12 to 19, and severe dementia less than 12. So the cognitive score matters, but also the score and dependence also matters. Their independence or dependence in instrumental activities and ADLs and increasing behavioral changes will also influence whether we call this mild, moderate or severe. Across the bottom, you can see in years uh, progression, and this is sort of a typical progression, although I believe that progression is actually uh, taking longer now, partly because we may be identifying it earlier. On the vertical axis, you can see the mini mental state score, and with the very earliest symptoms with mild carbon payment, there may be very little impaired, and the family may just say, Oh, I think uh, it's old age. Sometimes it's dismissed as being old age, but that uh, it will progress, and then you get that steeper portion of the curve and families are saying, well, things are really started to become quite obvious over the last six months or a year. And then there's the loss of functional independence uh, with the instrumental activities being affected and behavioral changes and progression on. There are risk factors for cognitive impairment, uh, age being the most important risk factor. Uh, the longer you live, the more likely you are at risk of developing dementia. So be careful what you wish for. Dementia um, is also uh, can be predicted by a risk gene called the APOE4 gene. APOE comes in three variants, APOE2, 3, and 4. And if you have one or two copies of APOE4, that's an increased risk. And that ties in often to the family history and the reason for the family history. Now, there is a list of conditions that can be changed on the right-hand side. Uh, you can read them there, and these are things that we're going to focus on as ways to actually try and prevent 
the possibility of developing carbon impairment as well as to, if it does occur, to slow the progression. Now, the risk can be quantified. Uh, it's a little arbitrary, but this, uh, these approximations uh, are reasonable. Uh, at age 60, the risk of someone actually having dementia is about 1% and in 65, 2%. You can see as you go down age alone, there's a doubling every five years. However, if you then add, say, two risk factors, there's a further uh, quadrupling. So you double with one risk factor added to age plus another doubling with two risk factors. So by age 80, the risk of having dementia with two risk factors and age is about 64 percent. Dementia, probable Alzheimer's disease, the formal definition is really a disease which is insidious in onset and I've alluded to this that it may occur over years, certainly not hours or days, that's usually uh, the acute confusional state that we call delirium. So it's important to make that distinction and it's important to recognize that people who have dementia can actually develop delirium on top of their um, dementia. There is a clear cut history of worsening of cognition by report or observation. And then the, the most prominent deficit that family notice is this ability to recall. So people repeating already answered questions, repeating themselves during a telephone conversation, for instance. Uh, the other thing that we look for is another cognitive domain. So it may be word finding, having trouble finding the right word, usually nouns, impaired object and face recognition. This is less common, but it's related to visual spatial determination. And there may be impaired reasoning. So people will start to show impaired judgment that could occur with driving, for instance, or other tasks, uh, impairment with cooking. And this relates to what we call executive fun dysfunction. And I'll show how we screen for those things on the MOCA. And then there's the absence of other neurologic uh, or non-neurologic conditions uh, such as depression. Uh, the changes in memory uh, is something that really families should take uh, seriously and uh, report it to the family doctor, giving some details of that. Uh, the family physician should take this seriously and get that history usually with the caregiver or family member alone to appreciate the full extent not usually in front of the family member with the cognitive impairment and then to measure it with a tool like the montreal cognitive assessment uh, this is what the mocha looks like As some of you may have uh, seen this before there's the animal naming there's the clock test the cube copy and the what we call the modified trails B, and that's the order we usually do them. And then we give the person to some words to remember, and we give it to them uh, once, they repeat the words back, and then repeat them again, they repeat them again. So that's the process of registration. Then we ask them to remember them, and then we go on and do these additional tests there of attention and tests of language. So there's some serial sevens there. Some people are not good at math and have difficulty with that. Uh, never were good at math, so we make allowances for that, and that's why the score is a bit reduced. And the language, uh, repeating the sentences, fluency is the number of words in a minute beginning with a certain letter, and then the abstraction, looking for transportation and a measurement uh, for watch and ruler. And then coming back to the delayed recall, do you remember the five words? You should be able to say the five words now, and then if you can't, then we would go into category queuing. So it might be a part of the body and you remember the face, or it might be a, um, a color and you'd say red. And then you would go down into the category queuing. If they couldn't get it with category queuing, then you go to multiple choice queuing. So for the color, you might say it's one of these three words, red, blue, or green, and then they would guess it. And then you could score that uh, they wouldn't get any points for it, but you would see that in that delayed recall, that's the very sensitive portion where people really first lose the points on a, a mocha, particularly if they're starting to have very early mild impairment and uh, as they have dementia, they will lose points in some of the other areas. And then on the orientation, the most common one is the date is the thing that is most lost. 
There are blood tests that can be done to rule out reversible causes of uh, memory loss, and the family physicians usually have done this to, to determine that there, these things uh, are normal. And then we may do some scanning of the brain uh, at a clinic here. We prefer to do a magnetic resonant imaging as we get um, a clearer um, definition of white matter changes or small strokes using an MRI than on a head CT scan. And then there are reasons there why a person may want to have a scan if there's new onset of headaches, if there's a, a gait disorder, uh, some unusual uh, behavior or progressive language problems. The plaques and tangles uh, are represented here on the uh, normal neurons, three normal neurons in the cytoplasm on the left and on the right as three amyloid plaques, the brown deposits of amyloid protein. We know that it's amyloid protein now, and we know that the neurofibrillary tangles, which are, are deposited within the nerve cells themselves, are due to a protein called tau protein, B-A-U, is how you spell that. And these are the pathological changes that Alzheimer observed and the changes that are characteristic at autopsy of Alzheimer's disease. So that's how we make that final diagnosis, the definite diagnosis of autopsy. Now, vascular dementia, in contrast to Alzheimer's, uh, um, the similarities would be the uh, impairment in social and occupational functioning and a decline from their previous level. But the difference is that they have focal neurologic symptoms and signs. So they may have weakness on one side of the body. They may have sudden onset of loss of speech. And they will have on a head CT scan or MRI some changes to yes, small strokes. And that this is not due to some other condition like delirium that I mentioned earlier. And this sh shows you what an MRI might look like. There is in the central part of the screen the two uh, symmetrical dark areas, the so-called ventricular system. You can see the wriggly parts of the brain, the gyri, and the on um, the outside you can see the skull and the uh, dural coverings of the brain, the tissue covering over the brain. But you can see these white areas and the arrows pointing to those two strokes, those dark areas. Those are small strokes and these are so-called lacuna infarcts, or infarct is a, a medical term for stroke but these little lake-like infarcts. And so you can see several of those. And these are the sort of changes that are seen. Now, on that visit to the family physician, they will look for risk factors for stroke or the so-called vascular risk factors, which are, uh, are listed there, often associated with uh, uh, obesity, not necessarily. And uh, the things that the family doctor would want to do is treat those conditions and also to uh, encourage reduction of alcohol and drugs that will affect memory. A common one that people might take would be an anticholinergic drug like Benadryl for sleep, which is not a good drug to be taking because that in itself can be a risk factor for developing dementia. Uh, treating depressive symptoms initially with non-drug approaches and finally drug approaches. And then the family physician will assess risks of other things such as progression, uh, risk of progression to difficulty with driving, making sure that a person is able to do wills and powers of attorney ahead of time, maybe have a discussion about resuscitation preferences, whether they want natural death or resuscitation, and then talk about some lifestyle changes and make a referral to the specialist if it seems appropriate. Uh, not everyone needs to see a specialist, it's usually for the more difficult uh, and less certain cases. Uh, one of which is these frontotemporal degeneration. Now there are seven different types of frontotemporal degeneration. We're only going to mention three here. The most common one is the so-called fixed disease or behavioral variant presenting initially with disinhibited behavior. So unusual, uh, maybe making inappropriate uh, jokes, inappropriate sexual comments, changes in personality, apathy, not wanting to initiate anything. And there's an instrument called the Frontal Behavioral Inventory, which was developed by Dr. Cortez here in London, uh, which is done with the caregiver for actually trying to quantify these changes and it can be repeated over time. There are two different types of language impairments that are important to pay attention to. And the 
uh, early signs of the first one is effortful, hesitant, word-finding difficulties. And this is the progressive non-fluent aphasia variant. And then the early signs of the second type of primary progressive aphasia is the fluent speech. So they can speak fluently, but they have difficulty finding the words or knowing the meaning of the words, this is a semantic variant. Lewy body, in contrast, may present with early visual hallucinations and Parkinsonism and eventually fluctuations in levels of consciousness. And there may also be sensitivity to the so-called typical and atypical antipsychotic drugs. So those are things like haloperidol, risperidone, you may have heard of some of these drugs. They're likely to cause Parkinsonism if at a high enough dose, but in a person with Lewy body disease, even with a low dose, it will cause Parkinsonism. And often people will suddenly realize this is Lewy body disease that's causing the visual hallucinations and that they don't need to be on these um, antipsychotic drugs. They may also have restless legs. It can be difficult to diagnose, because sometimes it may be superimposed on another diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's. A disease. We can't have any neuroimaging that actually uh, uh, yields this. Now there is an interaction between vascular dementia and Alzheimer's disease living to mixed dementia where there's an overlap between these two. So people may have features of Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia and this is certainly evident at um, autopsy examination. Uh, Lewy body can sometimes even be in there as well. There's another newer form of dementia that has been uh, characterized last year called LATE, L-A-T, and that's short for limbic age-related TDP43 encephalopathy. TDP43 is the type of protein abnormality that leads to this. So it's not amyloid and it's not a, a, a tau protein, the different protein abnormality and it is affecting people over the age of 80, and it's about 17% of all cases of dementia by some estimates. It presents primarily as memory loss. There may be problems with some thinking and reasoning, but it is primarily involving the hippocampus. Uh, there's evidence of this uh, shrinkage on the MRI scan. And there may be preservation of personality, so it may be entirely preserved or, or uh, without any behavioral changes, but primarily a memory problem in people in their late 80s and 90s. This is commonly the people that we think of. And uh, it's important to differentiate uh, this from Alzheimer's disease because most of the current clinical trials, which I'll mention a little later, are targeting Alzheimer's disease. And so if one actually wants to have a treatment, uh, it's going to be important that these are uh, specific uh, for Alzheimer's disease or late and that we can actually somehow distinguish these using imaging. We don't have uh, imaging specifically for this protein DTP43 yet, but it will come. There is the prevention strategies, uh, the risk factors, I've alluded to these, uh, and these are some targets for people to look at home. And it's important for people to be involved with self-management. Standing blood pressure 130 of 80 and an older individual is a reasonable blood pressure recording. Monitoring of the diabetes at home with the hemoglobin A1C, keep tracking how things are over the last three months. Elevated cholesterol, monitoring that with uh, diet, exercise, or drugs. Certainly, smoking uh, cessation should be uh, encouraged um, and uh, with assistance to try and stop the smoking, atrial fibrillation with uh, so-called blood thinning medications, uh, which prolong the co coagulation time, and then coated aspirin may be appropriate as well. Now, uh, there are non-drug approaches to try and reduce the cognitive decline. And these are listed there. So the exercises, mediterranean style diet, mental stimulation, socialization, restorative sleep, reduction in alcohol and the psychoactive drugs. The Benadryl was one. Amitriptyline would be another example of a drug which has a strong anticholinergic agent. And then recreational drugs. Exercise, uh, there's a body of evidence that has been uh, showing that there are some benefits using neuroimaging. So greater gray matter in the prefrontal cortex and hippocampus with exercise. There are randomized control trials in people who have dementia. So these are people who already have dementia, 
So these people continuing to be involved with exercise is important. And that would be aerobic exercise. And it needs to be, if you're going to do walking, it needs to be brisk walking. But certainly walking is a good exercise to be doing. If you need any encouragement to exercise and the rationale for why it's helpful, you can look at this whiteboard video. If you Google uh, Dr. Mike Evans or just 21 and a half, uh, 23 and a half hours, you will find that. It's quite entertaining. Uh, longitudinal prospective studies. So these are studies where they're not um, looking at uh, physical activity, uh, preventing uh, Alzheimer's disease and reducing the risk of Alzheimer's disease. So people who are able to um, follow exercise routines compared to people who don't are much more likely to reduce the risk of progression. Mediterranean style diet is depicted there and you can see uh, at the base we want a lot of um, whole grains, uh, fruit and vegetables, olive oil and nuts, uh, fish, uh, particularly the fatty fishes for the omega-3 fatty acids and trying to avoid red meats like beef and pork, lamb, having it occasionally as a treat. And then there are observational studies of the Mediterranean style diet and those who have high, ad high adherence to the Mediterranean diet will either slow the rate of cognitive decline or minimize the conversion to Alzheimer's disease and improve cognitive function. Now this is a study which actually combined the effect of diet and exercise and introduces the idea of having multiple modalities. So in the dark line there, across the bottom, you've got years, across the x-axis and on the vertical axis is the risk of remaining or the likelihood or probability of remaining free of dementia. And you can see the dark line of people with high physical activity and high diet scores combined, and they have a risk of about 20, 25% of progressing to dementia over the 12 years not having had dementia at the beginning. And these are older individuals. And then the dotted line in the middle, low physical activity, low diet score. And these people have dropped almost to 50% likelihood of having dementia after that period of time. And a further multi-domain study is the finger study. And this is one where there was multiple interventions, nutrition, physical activity, cognitive training, and vascular monitoring. And it was a two-year randomized control trial. So two studies, the uh, control group uh, had health advice, and they found that there was improved cognition and reduced risk of cognitive decline in the intervention group. Now, the control group also improved, but the improvement was more in the uh, group, the intervention group listed there. And this has left uh, led to the finger uh, study has led to the worldwide finger initiative and in uh, the states they've got a pointer study and there is a proposed study in Canada called the cam thumbs up study which also will eventually be a multi-domain intervention and some of you uh, may be of interest people with mild impairment people with uh, normal cognition can uh, participate in the study and and I think this would be an important a Canadian initiative to this worldwide finger initiative. There's emerging evidence for those things there. I'm not going to go through that uh, in the uh, interest of time, but hearing is something that does need to be taken uh, notice of, and it is a risk factor for dementia. It needs to be addressed. It's not clear whether addressing hearing impairment will improve it. Uh, it certainly will improve mental stimulation and, and hopefully socialization. So. It's, it's possible that it will make a difference and people are certainly studying that, but avoiding hearing impairment is important as well. One of the things uh, I wanted to just briefly mention in this time of, of our COVID crisis is the importance of socialization, which is occurring in our nursing home. Some of you may have family members who are in a nursing home. And this was a study where they, in 26 nursing homes, decided in April of this year that they were going to study an uh, opening of the uh, nursing homes and these selected nursing homes, and they were going to evaluate it with those interventions there, questionnaire, telephone, and analysis of the local visiting protocols. 
and also a WhatsApp group, and they had representatives from each of those nursing homes to participate. And they found that there were some variations in the use of personal protective uh, equipment. There was some difference in where the location of the visits took and, and to the extent that there was supervision. Some of them, they had the, they, their protocol they used for the nursing home. They had the visiting outdoors, others indoors. Others, they actually allowed the visitors to go in the room and close the door. And so there were almost 60% of the, of the residents uh, did want to have visitors or were able to have visitors in these 26 nursing homes. And what they found is that the experience was very positive, it, it added value, real personal contact between the residents and loved ones, and a good uh, positive impact on their well-being. Uh, the compliance with the local uh, guidelines uh, was good between the nursing homes and by the visitors. And they found that in that period of time, up until June 5th, uh, just uh, 25 days ago, they found um, no COVID infections reported in those nursing homes. And so now the Dutch government is moving to allow all nursing homes to cautiously open using the guidelines that they've established. And I would hope uh, that this is something that other governments, uh, particularly our own, might see a place to be able to relax some of the guidelines. And I know at Parkwood, we've been having some discussion about how we could actually have more visiting. So in the last 10 minutes, I want to be able to talk about uh, treatment options. Uh, there are symptomatic treatments, and this is following the blue line. And there is a list of drugs that followed that, and we've had those drugs available for over 20 years. There is the disease modifying treatment line, which is what we want to do if we have successful interventions that can actually modify the course of the disease. So you can see that yellow line again, that sloping line down to the right over nine or 10 or longer years. And we want to actually be able to modify that so more people could actually be independent and living in the community. They may not be driving, but they'd be in the community. They may not have to go into a nursing home. So the drugs that we do have that may have a modest effect are listed there. You may know them by the names in the brackets, the generic names uh, to the left, and then modest, if, if best temporary effects, and the same for memantine, which is for people with moderate to severe Alzheimer's disease. Now coming back to the plaques and tangles that Alzheimer had seen, and uh, we want to talk a bit more about understanding the course of Alzheimer's disease. So going from left to right, uh, people who are normal, cognitively normal, mild cognitive impairment, and eventually dementia. And this is the progression that we've talked about on the spectrum of cognitive decline. And what you can see there is that even while someone's cognitively normal, if you follow that red line, that is the amyloid A-beta protein. A-beta stands for amyloid beta. That's the amyloid rising uh, as an abnormal biomarker, and we have ways of measuring that with PET scans. The tau-mediated uh, neuronal injury can also be measured on a PET scan now, and the structural change really refers to the MRI scan. So by the time a person has mild cognitive impairment, now we're starting to see changes in the brain with some shrinkage of the hippocampi, some enlargement of the ventricles, and shrinkage in other parts of the brain. And then they will be showing that the family are noticing that memory is changing and clinical functions uh, declining later on. That's the activities of daily living. So you can see that the amyloid and the tau proteins are accumulating long before a person actually starts to have cognitive impairment. We can measure this on an amyloid PET scan. The one on the left is the so-called normal or negative PET scan. It's not capturing any significant accumulation of amyloid being deposited in the brain. And in the right image, you can see a so-called positive scan. And these are images from a treatment trial with aducanumab, uh, trying to show what the effect of different doses of the medication is. So you can see at the top, uh, placebo, and then three milligrams per kilogram, six milligrams per kilogram, and 10 milligrams a kilogram at the bottom. And if you compare the images side by side, on the left is the baseline and on the right is the image at one year. So you can see in the top image, there may be 
a little bit more amyloid has accumulated in that person on the placebo. But in the person on three milligrams, six milligrams, and 10 milligrams, you can see increasing amounts of amyloid removed from the brain. So this certainly proves that anacanumab can remove amyloid from the brain. And there are other interventions, antibodies, having a similar effect, removing amyloid from the brain and hopefully reducing the accumulation of those tau tangles. It is the tau tangles that are the things that destroy the nerve cells and are associated with the cognitive decline. So in this image, you've got uh, across the bottom, you can see three cognitively normal people and one person with Alzheimer's dementia. And you can see the A-beta, uh, the PIB scan is the type of uh, scan that um, is the compound, the tracer that's used in the amyloid PET scan. And you can see increasing amounts of amyloid. And so even though there's quite a lot of amyloid there, you can see by the third image, that person still is cognitively normal. And you can see the tau is starting to in accumulate. So a small amount of tau is accumulating in the person, to, on the third person who's still cognitively normal. But once you start to get a lot of uh, amyloid accumulating in the region, of the temporal lobe, particularly the what we call the entorhinal cortex and the hippocampus, that this person now has dementia. There are reasons why people may want to participate in clinical trials, and these are the reasons that we uh, think about or talk to people about when they come to the aging brain and memory clinic after we've made a diagnosis, we've done all of the non-drug approaches, started a colonesterase, and ever we say, is there anything else that you might want to consider and that might be a clinical trial. Now, if they don't have mild impairment, they're not going to be on the colonesterase inhibitors. But people may respond just to the placebo effects, thinking that they may be on the study medication, but in fact are on a placebo. It has a positive effect. You've heard the term, give them a placebo or give that person a placebo. And, and people do respond to a, a placebo. You get close medical monitoring during a trial. The person may be coming every month or every two weeks. There may be stimulation or interaction with another group of people. There may be referral to a community resource. Uh, if we notice that a person is not using that, that might be to the Alzheimer's Society. It might be to the uh, Dementia Services of McCormick Home, Salvation Army uh, Day Program, for instance. So these are resources uh, that may be accessed. Uh, it could be the Learning the Ropes Program. Uh, continued access to the drug after the open label, as an open label, after the blinded randomized control trial portion is finished after a year or two years. And then altruism. Many people say, I'd like to be able to give back. I'm benefiting from other people's contribution to research. I'm on medications which other people have proven are firstly safe and effective, and I'm benefiting from my cholesterol, my high blood pressure, and this is a way I can help. So these are some of the studies. This is an observational study that we're very proud of here. This is something called the Compass ND study, a very ambitious study funded through CIHR and uh, with biomarkers uh, measuring with clinical questionnaires, memory testing, blood, saliva, MRI. There's an optional lumbar puncture and a clinical visit with three or four visits over so three months. I anticipate towards the end of this year, we'll be closing this study. Um, and uh, this study, um, uh, we have been obviously had a slowdown with the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, we haven't been able to see people uh, who newly to come into research. We're hoping that will start quite soon. Again, the uh, people who are really in trials and uh, intervention studies have been able to continue. There are new intervention trials. These are people either who have mild cognitive impairment or early dementia due to Alzheimer's disease, their mini mental score on that American scale is between 20 and 30, not the MOCA. That's the common one that's used for screening using that memory test. And then they may have an amyloid PET scan. Uh, the elector phase two study is an intravenous antibody. And it's interesting in that it promotes uh, cells, particular cells which are in the brain for, if you like, uh, removing uh, things like amyloid and, and other waste, uh, microglial cells, and to try and clear amyloid. And then there's the intravenous antibody to amyloid every two weeks over 
two years. This is a different study by Isai. It's a Japanese company, uh, the so-called BAN study. Uh, there is a further study in people who have normal memory, but they have risk factors for dementia due to Alzheimer's disease, and they have a mini mental score between 27 and 30. So they really have largely normal memory, and they have a screening memory test, and then they have an amyloid scan. So these are people who are 60 and over, and if the amyloid scan is positive, then these people are at risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. This is the so-called AHEAD study, the A345 study, and it uh, shows that uh, from the earlier studies looking at moderate Alzheimer's disease, it may be too late to actually remove amyloid at that point. So this is really going much earlier. It's a private-public partnership, and uh, it's going to be partnering with the E-size band. They've chosen that because of the dramatic clearance of amyloid. And the participants will get two different doses of amyloid depending on their amyloid level on the PET scan. So they'll have a higher dose if they've got more amyloid in the brain. And then there is a further trial uh, with people with mild carbon payment and early dementia due to Alzheimer's disease. Uh, this is to start soon. Uh, it's the Anavex study. Again, there's the screening test. And there is also cerebrospinal fluid by lumbar puncture. And the results come back to the participants. So with Alzheimer's disease and the cerebrospinal fluid, as the amyloid has been accumulating in the brain, the amyloid, which is naturally occurring and is in the cerebrospinal fluid, it's going down and the tau protein in the cerebrospinal fluid is rising as there is the damage occurring to the brain through the neurodegeneration process that the tau protein is causing. So you get that amyloid going down in the cerebrospinal fluid and the tau going up. And you can look at that ratio. And then this is a study over a year, followed by what was called an open label study. So in summary, uh, we want to emphasize that it's important for family members to provide the history and the early observations of change and memory uh, language or mood to the family physician, repeated memory tests over time, and show the change or progression. And that can be done by the family doctor and the specialist in combination. We share the results. Our non-drug approaches may slow progression and then research participation will advance new understandings and treatments. I just want to acknowledge my colleagues uh, in the cognitive clinical trials group at Parkwood Institute, uh, Jenny Wells, uh, Elizabeth Finger and Stephen Pasternak in cognitive neurology at Parkwood, uh, Sarah Best, our research manager, all of our other staff, some of whom you may have uh, interacted with uh, in their roles as coordinators or research assistants or nurses. And there's also a uh, neuropsychologist, Dr. Jennifer Fogarty, who's been very important in providing additional neuropsychological testing, where and sometimes we're uncertain, uh, particularly with people with very early symptoms, and she will do a very detailed uh, uh, psychological, neuropsychological testing over a period of three or four hours and then reviewing that with the person and their family. And then the cognitive uh, uh, researchers uh, across the city uh, listed there who we collaborate with on our research. So um, we've got, um, I think uh, Nancy is going to uh, take over now. That correct or is it uh, Dina? So we, uh, yeah, so Nancy does have a question for you, Dr. Bori. That was a great presentation. Thank you so much. So if anyone would like to add a question in the Q&A box, please do so now and we're happy to, Dr. Bori is happy to answer those. Uh, Nancy does have a question. She says, thank you for the presentation, Dr. Bori. Can you speak to the role of restorative sleep in these diseases and do you have any suggestions for getting better sleep? Okay, thank you for that. Um, and we can expand a bit on what we mean by restorative sleep. So if someone has actually had restorative sleep, they will feel that way when they wake up. So they wake up and they are feeling that they are rested, that they have had a, uh, a satisfactory uh, sleep through the night. Usually we would say that would usually be at least seven hours, uh, could be a bit longer. And um, 
it, it, it is important that people focus on that. Uh, we, have, we always ask about sleep and people will come with uh, very disruptive patterns of sleep. And part of it is behavioral uh, and there are some many different factors that go into that. And so we then start to dig into that a bit and talk about sleep hygiene. And that's something that people can certainly read about uh, in terms of strategies for sleep hygiene. So common uh, sleep hygiene strategies is to have actually regular routines through the day. And it's not just the diet, but it's the regular patterns of exercise. So if you're going to be doing that regular exercise, not doing it last thing at night, doing it in the evening, doing it in the morning, so that one is actually expending energy during the day, uh, having the regular diet. Uh, alcohol is something that we discourage people if they're having sleep problems, because alcohol is very disruptive to sleep. It, destroys normal sleep architecture and it also uh, inhibits the enzyme uh, anticholinergic uh, sorry the antidiuretic hormone which is the hormone that comes from the brain that tells the kidneys not to make urine in the middle of the night and it's important to have that because you don't want to be making urine in the middle of the night if you take alcohol you have additional fluid on board plus you inhibit that enzyme and you make more urine, you're getting up to the bathroom and that's disturbing your sleep, as well as disturbing the sleep architecture. One of the things that we think happens if we get restorative sleep is that it removes amyloid from the brain. So we think there is some evidence, uh, particularly from rat studies, and, and we haven't done this in humans, but sleep position may be important, uh, and that for clearance of amyloid from the brain. So. Other sleep hygiene strategies is not using uh, bright lights, uh, such as looking at screens before you're going to bed, reading calming books. There's even people now who have these talking books and uh, podcasts where you can listen to them and you can actually have a book which is deliberately written and read in a way that it would put you to sleep. And so it's, uh, um, uh, but there are other strategies as well. Uh, avoiding uh, the drugs uh, that might disturb sleep. So some of the benzodiazepines, the short-acting benzodiazepines, like the short-acting Valium-like drugs, uh, lorazepam. Uh, these drugs are sometimes helpful if you're traveling, not that people are doing that very often these days, but uh, um, uh, using drugs, if they do need assistance with sleeping, uh, weaning them down off those drugs very slowly, and then something like trazodone can be a helpful drug. Uh, there are additional strategies, but you can get the idea that this, this is something that one has to approach uh, in a very systematic way and then trying to strive for that restorative sleep. Thank you for that, Dr. Bori. Another question is, how do you apply to do a clinical trial? Well, it depends on uh, the contact information was on the screen there, and um, a person can uh, first in call and express interest. Uh, certainly, we're very keen to have a discussion with the person. Do they want to be uh, involved with an observational study? Uh, do they want to be with an, involved with an interventional study? And is that something that they would... Uh, it depends a bit on their, their time commitment. It, usually you have to have a, a study partner that comes with you. So if a person's going to participate, they need someone who can at least be contacted by phone who can be able to corroborate some of the information that we need to get as the trial goes on. And then we would look at, do some initial screening tests and see what your interest was and see what we could offer you. So I think that certainly if, if people are here in London or in the surrounding areas, we have people coming from Owen Sound, we have people coming from Windsor, so people are certainly willing to travel. Um, one of the things people should know is that if you're participating in a clinical trial, any um, out-of-pocket expenses such as travel expenses or parking expenses or if you need a meal while you're part of uh, at Parkwood Hospital, uh, we can provide that out of our research budgets. So I think uh, inquiring and uh, touching base with the Cognitive Clinical Trials Group at Parkwood is, is, would be a first step. Thank you, Dr. Bori. The next question, when do you anticipate medication being generally available? Well, um, if we're talking uh, 
uh, about disease modifying treatments. Those is, I think is, is what the question would, would be because we already have uh, some of the symptomatic treatments which are modest as I indicated. Uh, when would we uh, like to see them available um, and under the Barack Obama mandate, they actually set themselves a target in the states of um, 2025. And uh, in a sense, this was almost like uh, the same sort of goal that was established by Kennedy when he said we want to be on the moon uh, at the beginning of the decade and wanted to do it within the decade. And it's as difficult task, if not in some respects more difficult to actually find something that's going to be disease modifying. But we are seeing uh, this one drug at Acanemab. I mentioned some of the other companies that are, um, and I haven't mentioned all of them uh, because some of them are ongoing or they're uh, closed to recruitment. Uh, there are other compounds being developed as well. You can also get the sense that these trials, the disease modifying trials, go on for a long period of time. They go on for two years and then they may continue for a further two years observation. So any study that's starting now, we're not going to have answers until those studies are fully enrolled with often more than a thousand, two thousand people in those trials. And these are global studies. These are coming from many countries many sites, maybe as many as 200 sites from around the world. Our contribution is one site uh, with 200 or more sites across the world. And then those studies have to be analyzed. But I think in the next five years, I think we are certainly getting closer to something that looks like it has the potential for you to be disease modifying. Uh, we're always uh, tries to be realistic. We try to be optimistic. Uh, because we're seeking uh, something that will make things better for people and keep them independent for a longer period of time and hopefully keep them uh, having a, a better quality of life than having this uh, progressive disease. So I, I think uh, in that time frame, I think we may see something uh, coming and there's certainly some very promising developments. Thank you, Dr. Bori. We have a question in our chat. Um, they say, my dad has been diagnosed with vascular dementia and spent four weeks at Parkwood after a four-week stay at LHSC and has been treated as part of the geriatric program by, by Dr. Bangu. He is now home, but just wondering how he could get referred to the Aging Brain Clinic or if he would qualify. Well, um, Dr. Bangu is a colleague. Uh, Dr. Jasper Bangu joined our group. Uh, he's an MD, uh, PhD, geriatrician researcher. He's uh, very knowledgeable and uh, has a, a lot of additional training in uh, stroke uh, cognitive impairment, uh, which is what uh, this, uh, your father uh, has been diagnosed with, the vascular dementia. So um, he is a colleague, he, he works very closely with us. Uh, there may not be any advantage to coming uh, to the Aging Brain and Memory Clinic if he's already seen one specialist. It's not that I would necessarily, or Dr. Wells or uh, the, uh, Dr. Um, Wells or myself would necessarily have a different viewpoint from Dr. Bangu. And so he may already be well served by what the, Dr. Bangu is actually able to offer him, but um, it's something to discuss with him and see whether there's anything uh, that uh, would be uh, of benefit. Discuss it with Dr. Bangu in the first place, I think. That might be a starting point. Thank you. The next question, is there additional risk of dementia for those who have atrial fibrillation if taking a blood thinner? Is there additional risk uh, if they're on a blood thinner? So let's talk about that first. The risk of atrial fibrillation and why do we want to treat it? So atrial fibrillation is the irregular heartbeat and a person has a tendency to develop clots which sit in the atrium, uh, the left atrium of the heart and every so often they can be pushed out from that area and go to the brain or even to other parts of the body, to the arm or the leg or the gut, but more commonly they go to the brain. And if they go to the brain, they will cause a stroke. If they're 
a large clot, it will cause a large stroke, causing paralysis in one side of the body. If there are a whole shower of small strokes, they may hit those uh, small blood vessels uh, in the central part of the brain, in the so-called subcortical part of the brain, and cause cognitive impairment more slowly over a period of time. So you want to treat that. It can be treated with aspirin, but more effectively with an anticoagulant, either one of the uh, warfarin or Coumadin is the other name for it, or one of the NOAX, the newer um, anticoagulant drugs, the non-Coumadin uh, drugs. And those um, reduce the risk of clots going to the brain. So that will reduce the risk of dementia because of clots going to the brain. However, there also needs to be a consideration of what is the risk of bleeding. So if someone were to spontaneously have a bleed from a blood uh, thinner, then that person uh, might have a bleed into the brain, not a clot, but a bleed into a tissue of the brain and destroy brain tissue in that way and have a stroke a stroke due to a bleed into that ventricular system, that central part of the brain, that space where cerebrospinal fluid is, or a bleed into the tissue. Uh, why would a person have a bleed? Sometimes they might have a bleed if they uh, were to fall down and, the, and they bump their head. The bleed might be inside the brain or it could be on the outside of the brain, the so-called subdural hematoma. Uh, the other type of bleed that can occur on anticoagulants, if a person has what uh, we now are able to identify on MRI scans, and one of the reasons why we do the MRI scans, are microbleeds. Microbleeds is something we've discovered in the last uh, six or seven years, where we can actually see with certain types of MRI sequences, and particularly the stronger uh, magnets used for research, the so-called three Tesla strength, instead of the 1.5 Tesla that is the typical MRI scan done at the hospital. But with the three Tesla research scan, you can sometimes see these microbleeds. And if a person has a lot of these microbleeds, those people probably should not be on an anticoagulant uh, like uh, Coumadin for atrial fibrillation. And so one has to then consider the risk. Is it more risky to have a bleed and balance the risk, uh, bleed uh, because you're on an anticoagulant, or if we don't have the anticoagulant, are we at greater risk of having uh, a stroke uh, from, atrial, from the atrial fibrillation, the clot going from the heart. So that's a difficult conversation to have. Thank you. Next question. Do you rec recommend a test to be done to determine if a person may develop Alzheimer's disease if one or both parents has it? So thank you for that uh, uh, question. It's um, so is there a test? So one would look at family histories. If uh, parents have had uh, dementia, particularly if they've developed dementia in their, uh, at a very young age, that would be concerning, like in their 30s or 40s, if someone developed that, then one might think there is a test that can be done. It's a genetic test. This is a rare disease, a rare genetic form of, of Alzheimer's disease. We, we see it very rarely. So this is probably not what is, is being thought of. But if a person developed dementia in their 50s, 60s, 70s, even 80s, one would say, what were their risk factors first? So go through all of the risk factors first. So if they smoke cigarettes or were exposed to smoke, because you don't have to smoke cigarettes, but if a parent of a person smoked inside the home, then that would be a risk factor of, of smoking, secondhand smoke. Uh, the other vascular risk factors, if they had any of those things, that would have increased the risk and made it more likely that they would have dementia. And if you don't have those risks, if you don't have high pressure, diabetes, elevated cholesterol, you don't smoke, then your risk would be lower. So maybe there's not going to be any tests to look for. If your parent developed uh, dementia in their um, uh, 60s or 70s had no risk, then you'd have to ask yourself why they didn't have head injuries that anyone knew about, they, there was no childhood abuse. And then I think um, uh, there is a test called the uh, APOE4 gene, which I, I uh, mentioned. 
Now, one needs to think about this carefully, the APOE4 gene, and it may be poor, become more relevant uh, if we actually have treatments that are responsive to APOE4 gene. So people with APOE4 gene, the treatment may be um, more effective. But you have to be careful about deciding whether or not to have that test. Um, it, it is a genetic test and it would tell you whether you had one or two copies of APOE. So most people in London would have two copies of APOE3. Some people will have APOE2, APOE3. Uh, there'll be about maybe 15% of one copy of APOE and there'll be about 3% will have two copies of APOE. Uh, however, in our clinic, about 50% of the people that come to our clinic have one or two copies of APOE, and that's because they have dementia and they're overrepresented. Uh, um, there's an overrepresentation of that gene in, in people with obviously with dementia, so that's why we see more people with that uh, positive test. The, the careful, you have to be careful with what you do with that information. And uh, the government tried to protect people so that insurance companies couldn't get hold of that information and then uh, somehow get that out of you and then increase your um, premiums because you had an APOE copy. So they can't ask you if they have that. By law, they're not allowed to do that, to ask you whether you have an APOE gene. Now, the other thing you have to ask about is what are you going to do with that information? Is it going to be, if you found that you had one copy of APOE, it means you're at increased risk. Does it mean that you're going to change your lifestyles? Is it going to motivate you to do things that you're not doing now? You're going to exercise, you're going to control your blood pressure better, you're going to make sure you get restored to sleep. If it motivated you to those things, that might be a reason to do it. If you're going to become horribly depressed, maybe that's not the reason you'd want to, to do it. Um, they have studied this and seen what happens when people do actually get this test. And this was the, this study they did, Dr. Green did in 2009, published it, you may want to look at it, but they actually studied what was the effect of people doing uh, the APOE gene. So they randomized people to receiving the test and randomized people not getting the information. They all were determined, they were all, um, had the test done, but only half was it actually revealed what gene they had. And they found that, you know, a year later, there was no detrimental effect to people uh, to actually learning that gene. It didn't necessarily mean that they, they made a change in their lifestyle, but I think that's something an individual would have to decide what they would do. It. The other thing is if you found you had two copies of the APOE4 gene, your parents you may be in your 40s or 50s, and if you have children, that now means that at least each of your children have one copy of APOE. Is that something you're gonna share with your children or not? Maybe they don't want to know. So you have to be careful about how you handle this information, because this is, is very important information. It is a risk gene. It's likely it will become more important later on if it actually influences the type of treatments that might be available. and if a certain treatment is recommended because a person is APOE4 positive, then that would be the time to actually definitely determine that gene at time. But right now, can you get it? You can go to your family physician, you request, request, I don't think it costs anything to have it done, but you have to be very, very careful about what are the implications of doing that. So you need to think that through. Sometimes people will get genetic counseling uh, before they do that sort of thing if they're serious, just to make sure that they have actually considered all of the consequences. We were running a study um, a couple of years ago where it did depend on knowing the genotype. People had to know whether they were APOE for positive one or two copies. Um, and uh, they, um, we did the counseling ourselves in house and, and we had good material for that and people were quite receptive to that. Uh, when I say one or two copies, why I just, I've made an assumption that everyone understands that for every gene you have, there are two copies, one from each of your parents. So you can get one from your mother from one for your father. So in this case, if both of your parents uh, were APOE, it's unlikely they would both be APOE two copies. It's possible each of them could have one copy.
Uh, if they each got had one copy, then your chance of getting one copy would you you there'd be a chance uh, that you would have at least one copy. But if you were unlucky, you might have got two copies. But that would be uh, depending on whether or not they have one or two copies. Thank you. Next question: Is there a general life expectancy from diagnosis for an Alzheimer's patient? It depends on the age at which a person develops the symptoms. It depends on what other so-called comorbid illnesses they have, so those vascular risk factors. So if a person has got a lot of vascular risk factors, they continue to smoke, they don't control their blood pressure, they don't control their diabetes, then the life expectancy is going to be less uh, if a person is actually able to control all of those uh, risk factors or if they don't have those risk factors, and then they do many of those uh, things that we talked about on the right side of the screen, the things that could actually modify the risk. So we would believe that it's going to be quite variable depending on your age, uh, your lifestyle, uh, the extent that you're motivated to actually reduce your risk. Uh, those, these things are all going to play into it. Uh, how long does a person have dementia? It, part of it depends on when did you actually first acknowledge that there were some problems. So sometimes we'll have family members who'll come and say, oh, you know, my husband's been having memory problems for a year. But when you actually start uh, and say to them, well, how were they in 2017? So go 2015, they were fine, and 16 and 17. Well, in 2017, things were starting to change a bit. So then you really start to give the story. This is not a one-year history. This is a three-year history. So it depends where you actually start, start this from. So because we're asking these questions that exploring where did it first begin, where did the symptoms first start, we're actually extending the duration of this illness because we're pushing back into that time which was sort of that gray area where people weren't quite sure whether something was happening or not. So I think there's many different factors. And obviously other illnesses come along. If a person is living alone, uh, maybe doing quite well, and they have, maybe they have arthritis and they have a fall for multiple reasons and break a hip, uh, and then they go into hospital and they get delirium. Delirium is a very bad thing to happen to you, to your brain. And then suddenly a person is much worse than they were. So living independently, but now maybe having a lot of mobility problems and may not even be able to go back home. And then they uh, have to go into care, maybe into a nursing home. And then uh, it suddenly things, things have suddenly changed. So falls, broken hips, head injuries are bad things for people to happen. I think from this COVID illness, we're also going to see uh, some um, interesting findings that comes out of the COVID uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, certainly people who get severe illness and go into hospital and have severe uh, illness, maybe on a ventilator, they will often have delirium. And this is going to be, it's like a, it's like a brain injury, the delirium to the brain at the time. I have looked at some of the autopsy results uh, from people who have died of COVID. And it doesn't appear, at least on the 30 odd autopsies that I've read about, um, that there is actually a disease process. Uh, there was some thought that maybe there would be blockage of small vessels in the brain or there may be inflammation of the brain tissues. There doesn't seem to be any of those changes. Uh, they're not detecting uh, the virus in the cerebrospinal fluid. I think there's one case reported where it was detected in the cerebrospinal fluid. Um, but so I think it's the delirium and the uh, cytochrome storm and the other damage to other tissues that are going to have an indirect effect on the brain. Thank you. The next question is actually, uh, very similar, so I'll read it, but I, if you want to add anything further, feel free. Does dementia eventually lead to death? If so, is there an average length of time from moderate dementia, dementia until the disease takes the person's life? So, Okay, so if we start um, 
is is it is it uh, does it lead to death? Yes, it can. And uh, and the irony of this is the good care that family members are providing someone at home with supports from community. A person conceivably could die at home of dementia. Uh, sometimes, when good care and they go into long-term care into a nursing home. They may die there, and I see the, the nursing care. I'm, I'm the, been the medical director for 30 years for the uh, two Perth, the Dementia Special Care Unit for veterans at Parkwood, and I see veterans there who die. I mean, many on, on our unit of the veterans there in their 90s, and they have arthritis and high blood pressure, and those things are managed. But the thing that they eventually die of is related to the dementia. What happens is the disease progresses. They start to eat less they forget if they're by themselves they forget eating I mean you can discover this by then they go into care and suddenly their weight improves they their nutrition improves but also as they get older and dementia they start to have difficulty with eating people are having to help them feed and sometimes it can take half an hour or an hour to actually feed someone and they will open their mouth and swallow but sometimes it'll get to the point where they'll stop swallowing properly and they will aspirate and so the food will go down uh, into the windpipe and, things, and they will get pneumonia and aspiration pneumonia. And so what did they die of? They died of aspiration pneumonia as the final illness. But the thing that led to that was the swallowing difficulty, the impairment with feeding that was caused by the dementia. So did they die of dementia? On the death certificate, I will put that as the final cause of death. That is the reason that it is. Now, coming back to moderate dementia um, and how long, it's, it's hard to say an average length of time. And I, I think that really depends on care and it depends, uh, it depends on any of the bumps along the road, if there are any illnesses that intervene. If a person get, develops urinary symptoms, urinary tract infections and gets sepsis and suddenly gets very sick and develops delirium, another cause of delirium, commonly that we see in long-term care or in, in the acute care hospital where people have come in from the community with a, a urinary infection and it's very severe consequences and they are much worse off. So these things are change and the people who have moderate dementia are at risk of that. The, probably the biggest risk they're at risk of is falling down They because they have impaired judgment uh, they'll go to sit down in a chair and the chair is just not there. It's, it's not right behind them, it's beside them. And they'll sit down and then they have a, it, that has consequences. So it's hard to generalize uh, really because it depends on what happens along the journey. Thank you. Next question. If one parent has vascular dementia and diabetes with concussion, would it even be helpful to have the genetic test? Um, I think, um, I, no, I, I just want to go back. I, I, I think I probably suggested around genetic testing. Uh, I, I was not advocating for the genetic testing. I was talking about the, 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 the risks or benefits of doing the genetic test, but people can certainly do the genetic test and get it if they want to. But you're raising the possibility here that the person has uh, vascular dementia uh, the, uh, if, if they also have diabetes, then that may be, uh, depending on the control of the diabetes, may have been a contributing factor to the vascular risk factor, because that would be a so-called uh, risk factor for those uh, strokes contributing to the vascular dementia. A concussion on top of that, it would depend a bit on when that happened, maybe, and whether there are repeated concussions. We certainly see people who have concussions as a young person, uh, people who said I was in hospital and was unconscious for several days or weeks as a child. You get teenagers of people in their 20s who have had horrendous motor vehicle crashes and have been in comatose for six weeks and then have returned. Their memory was never quite normal and then they started to have uh, problems later on. But then you also get people who have had repeated concussions from sports injuries, hockey, um, Football are common examples of that. And they've had repeated concussions. And each time they have a concussion, uh, what they do is um, uh, each time a, a concussion has actually occurred, they, um, each time the concussion has occurred, the symptoms 
are worse, even though the concussion may have been much less. So getting a concussion at any time is not a good thing, but it, it depends on the severity of the, the concussion uh, and also repeated concussions, I think. Uh, would that person get the genetic test? Um, it would depend a bit on the age of the parent. If the parent was in their 70s or 80s, probably not. I think we think of genetic tests when people are developing uh, dementia at a much younger age without explanation, you know, 50s, 60s, uh, with only uh, unexplained cause. Uh, that would be the time that we might want to get the genetic test. Thank you, Dr. Bory. The next two are actually comments. Uh, thank you. Very informative lecture, thanks. How do, you, how do we get a specific dementia diagnosis? For example, vascular or Lewy body, et cetera. Okay, well, um, let's go to the, so, in any of the, the diagnosis, it needs the history, which comes from you. It means a very detailed history. So your contribution is critical to this. Uh, the physical and neurologic examination is going to be important. Uh, part of the history for a vascular dementia is looking at those vascular risk factors, but also are the histories of strokes or TIAs, transient ischemic attacks. So these are episodes, brief episodes of loss of neurologic function, weakness or loss of speech or loss of vision over a period of uh, hours which resolve and then doing the neuroimaging uh, for vascular dementia i indicated that an mri scan was preferable provided a person's not claustrophobic and provided they don't have a pacemaker and they hopefully weren't if they weren't a world if they were a welder but they've had a brain a, a scan plain x-rays of their eyes to see there's no metal in their eyes but doing an MRI scan to see the vascular changes and putting all of those things together would actually help you come up with a diagnosis of, of a vascular dementia. The dementia piece, you actually have to show that the instrumental activities of daily living are impaired to get to that threshold of dementia. The Lewy body uh, needs to be um, uh, really the history of people presenting with the vascular, uh, with the visual hallucinations and often that's the first symptom. The fluctuation le as levels of consciousness usually occurs later on. And the Parkinsonism, so they have a park, they look Parkinsonian, they have a flat looking expression in their face, the blinking rate is reduced. They may be stooped, they may be walking um, more slowly with smaller steps. Uh, However, the Lewy body disease is, is a tricky one because it can come on top of either vascular dementia or Alzheimer's disease. So sometimes it will present straight out as primary uh, Lewy body disease with those visual hallucinations. But sometimes, uh, as I saw in, in a veteran recently, uh, he had uh, dementia, probably of a vascular nature, but now was developing vas visual hallucinations. And in him, it probably was vascular. Mm -hmm. Uh, first, and then Lewy body on top of that. And sometimes when you get those two combinations, a person may actually get worse quite quickly. I've certainly seen that happen where the Lewy body has actually progressed quite quickly after an initial diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. And when you look at the pathology after autopsy, you see the changes of Alzheimer's disease and also the changes of, of Lewy body disease. When you do the autopsy, you don't necessarily get the timing of when the changes are occur. But if there's, you know, uh, prominent, they look at the prevalence of the changes throughout the brain and uh, make some sort of judgment, the pathologist does, as to what was the predominant uh, cause of the dementia. But then it's the clinician that's actually going to put the picture together with the information that comes from you as a family member. Thank you. This next uh, is a comment referencing uh, a previous discussion that you, you talked about uh, regarding concussions. Uh, repeated concussions in family doesn't have these risk factors. So I'm not, I, I'm not. Okay, so um, I can see the question on the screen and I'm wondering how to interpret that. Um, yeah, I think it's related to back to, this was the person I believe that father had had, a, had 
um, was in the hospitalized for a period of time, was at Parkwood and then had a fall as well. Uh, and then ended up developing uh, con a concussion as well. Um, so just... how would we characterize the question then? Is the, if I can connect that to... Um... Um, so she also mentions I... that um, her father has vascular dementia with AFib, but also bleeding in the brain. So he is difficult case. Dad fell at Parkwood and had a concussion from it, which they believe causes the bleeds. And then this question was related to, if a parent has a vascular dementia with diabetes, would you recommend getting the genetic test? I think this is all from the same person, as well as the repeated concussions of family doesn't have these risk factors. So I'm okay. not sure. If the, uh, sorry, if the family don't have those risk factors, um, then uh, again, that would be a reason not to do the test because if there's an, so I guess if there's an adequate explanation for why the person might have developed the symptoms of dementia at the time that they did from uh, vascular causes and from uh, concussions, um, I, I think uh, there would be no reason to do the uh, genetic test. Um, I, I, people do ask about genetic tests. I, the only time, and I'll be the only time I ever order it, uh, is rarely in those people who have a family history where the symptoms developed in their 30s and 40s, because we're looking for a genetic um, confirmation of the what we call the dominantly inherited Alzheimer's disease gene. So if a person inherits that gene, they are guaranteed to get Alzheimer's disease at the same age as their parent. But that is so rare, I think in 30 years at, with the clinic, I have seen maybe three people, uh, who four people who actually have carry that dominantly inherited gene. Uh, so that is rare. The, the APOE gene, as I indicated, 15% uh, of the population have one copy. And if you just went out to London and, and surveyed them, 15% would have one copy of APOE. And 3% uh, and would have two copies. Now, the other thing that is some emerging evidence that you may be able to modify that risk, that APOE4 gene risk, uh, exercise may in fact modify the risk that a person might actually develop dementia. So even though you're at increased risk with one copy of APOE, if a person exercises regularly and uh, follows all of the other lifestyle practices to reduce the risk, uh, that may actually modify that risk back to the sort of level of someone who just has uh, no copies of APOE. So there's some evidence to suggest that, which is encouraging. Thank you. So the next couple, of, we have some comments. Thank you very much. The session was very informative and helpful. Uh, there's another comment. Thanks so much for sharing your expertise and answering questions with such ease and knowledge. And uh, yes, the person just uh, was referencing back that they were thinking possibly no reason to take genetic testing. So that's the one that you just spoke to. So that's great. Um, and again, thank you for this seminar and all the information. And the last one is where can we find books that help people fall asleep? Well, this, this was something I heard on CBC recently. Um, and this is, this is uh, a, a woman who, uh, if, 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 um, if you subscribe to the program called Audible uh, on the, um, as a, where you can download books, but there are people uh, who uh, are um, now starting to, deliberately write books to promote sleep. And they write, uh, and these are recorded books. So you would listen to the book uh, as you, you wouldn't read it, you, at least this one, uh, you would listen to it, but it's written uh, with content that's not going to be disturbing, that's going to be soothing. And it's also going to be done in a very soothing voice. And so I remember uh, this particular interview, uh, I didn't fall asleep listening to it, but it was uh, 
she was um, telling about how she went about this, uh, but she did read from some of her books and the content certainly thought, you know, if you were comfortable in bed listening to this, it would be the sort of thing that would make you sleepy. So uh, I think people are looking at innovative ways to try and promote sleep. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, everyone, for staying on, and Dr. Bori especially for your extra time. We're now approaching eight o'clock, um, and so we're going to wrap up the series, but uh, or the webinar. But before I, I do, I would like to thank you, Dr. Bori, for taking the time out of your busy schedule to present this valuable information to us. We are very thankful, and we know that it will help many people. Thank you to everyone who has attended this web webinar. Uh, when you leave, you will be asked uh, a couple of questions. If you could please just take a minute to answer these, it helps us with future planning. This now concludes our current, uh, um, current webinar series. Please check out our website for any webinars you may have missed at alzheimerslondon.ca. Thank you again for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your evening and stay safe. Thank you.